And of all the characters to be in Nataku's protector, the person who would look after him, Kono was last on my list. This is such a bizarre, weird relationship that you kind of feel like every character watching this happen, where you know you can't really say he would be in any better hands than Kurno, but you don't like saying it. This is the weirdest Stockholm Syndrome relationship ever. Because this kid's so mentally bruised and broken, Unfortunately, the person who's best suited to keep him down in control and not grow into a powerful monstrosity that would be more powerful than a nuclear bomb is to let someone who enjoys abusing kids and bullying the weak to take care of him because he'll keep him weak and make sure he doesn't grow. It's like, what? <laughs> this is why you gotta love Fire Force. Its characters just continue to throw you for a loop. This episode, and most importantly this battle that we just witnessed, is easily to me the best battle that we've seen to date with one of the most interesting conclusions without a doubt in my mind. The whole idea that every one of these pillars has a protector of some sort and for someone like Shinra it's clearly the whole division that he's working with. They have his back, they'll do anything for him. Characters like Charon have been trying to be a best parent for so long and just keeps getting almost getting killed for his almost little daughter-like relationship, even though she has no care for Daddy Dearest in the slightest. But then you have someone like Kurano, and you're just like, he literally enjoys abusing kids. He likes bullying the weak, but because he sees one of his prey as getting too strong, he's keeping them down, and it's like, what? <laughs> this show's amazing. Fire Force Season 2 has played with my emotions unlike any other, and while you don't want to see these two together forever, hopefully with time this kid's mind will mend and he won't feel as held down by his parents and everything else, the crazy voice in his head, and who knows, maybe even Colonel will be redeemed someday, who, who knows with this show, I just fire force through me for a loop. The thing I really want to jump into first though is Charon. This guy is the GOAT. He is the MVP, he is the star of the episode to me. As great as this episode was, he was the man who literally took a star in his hand and shot it into the moon and made another crater. This character has always been a very interesting one because sometimes he makes you pissed off, sometimes you think he's a badass. In this episode, without him, everyone would have died. There was literally a nuclear bomb laser blast from the sun charging down, and this man did not back down. He was a total champ. He was willing to die for every pillar there, making sure that his duty as a protector was going to be fulfilled. I have never been more happy to see this man in an arc than just now, and I would safely say he's... I don't know if I would say my favorite, but... uh. He's in the top three, I would say, currently for Fire Force characters. It's so interesting having someone who's this big, strong, tough guy, but really is reading How to Raise Children books, as he has this little delinquent who just refuses to listen to him and is the cause of everything that we're seeing right now. But he's such a strong-willed guy that he refuses to back down for anyone, and he's willing to give his life for everyone in this situation, not even just the pillars, just making sure that no matter what, I will die trying before I just give up. And to see him be able to take that and just shoot it into the air, that was one of the most inspiring Fire Force moments to date. And I'm going to be very interested to see how much more we're going to see with this character. Because I've heard for a lot of people, Charon's one of their favorites. And I can see why. It's not even just his big action spectacle. It's the complex nature of what his life is like and how when you first get introduced to him, you really assume you know what he is. He's this Hulk-like character who has no emotion, who has no empathy. And then you see this episode and prior episodes as well. And you really do put into perspective how each side really has been kind of brainwashed to believe what they're doing is right. Even something like Shinra's division, right? Like, it's not to say, like, they're always going to make the right decisions, but for their side, they think they're doing what's right, even if they turn the whole world against them. It's so weird to watch these characters, and it was so inspiring to see what he was able to accomplish. I thought he was dying. Some people may say that's insane, there's no way he was going to die. He's the Reflector. But honestly, it felt like just with what he was absorbing into his body, he was going to die. I've never been more happy to see a character who I thought was going to die and, you know, every part of your brain is saying he's going to die. And to see him come out of it alive, not even mad in the slightest that, you know, it felt like they were building up to a death and we didn't get it. I am glad we didn't. This character has so much more to offer to this series and I'm so happy at the end of it. He's like, hey, you know what? Let's just leave the kid because I've had enough. I'm exhausted. I'm like, my boy, you do just that. You go get yourself. A nice beer, some hamburger, whatever you want, just you deserve a break. And I'm like, okay. Though I have to say, the backstory to this kid, it just keeps getting worse. 
you have this whole horrifying parent dilemma where you have someone who's been taught to get perfect on every test, to do flawless in every aspect of his life, and you can be a great doctor like your father someday. You have like an 87% on a test be claimed as a failure and how the father would just emotionally abuse the mother into saying you're not doing good enough. And to see how he got to that point, it's understandable why someone like Kerno would be the only person who could mend his broken mind because his parents, the people who are supposed to take the best care of him, brainwash a young child into being this child prodigy when he should have just been a kid at the end of the day. Kids are, yeah, you can definitely aid in their growth because you see potential, but if you toss away everything just so they can be this hot shot in the future, they're going to have a miserable life at the end of the day, and why would you want that as a parent? And then to see who turned him into literally a monster from his point of view, now is living inside his head rent free, you then have basically, you know, Uncle Reaper saying, you know, you have to fight. It's just nothing about his environment was healthy. And then for the first time, the most healthy thing that's ever happened to him is a lunatic who got him to fight him for so long saying it's okay to be weak. And this weird toxic relationship and it's like, he's in good hands for now, but I don't know about the future. And that's such a weird dilemma. I can understand why this art could be so polarizing for fandoms, but for me, I love every bit of the direction they took with this story. It made me feel so many emotions, and that's how you know the character writing's good. People who talk smack about season 1 couldn't talk smack about season 2 in the slightest, and even then, a lot of the smack talk for season 1 is over-exaggerated. There is things to criticize with it but it's not to the point that it's it ruined the entire season in the slightest, far from it. There was just five minutes upon ends on certain episodes that were just like, okay, we don't need this. But season two has yet to have any of those issues. And to see how complex the character relationships have been, I mean, if you would have asked me a character relationship between Nataku as well as Kurno could have ended like this a few weeks back, I would have laughed in your face and called you a lunatic. But it works. It was built up in a way that just makes you say it has to be like this, even though your heart's saying this can't be right. And it's great to see that and to see the destruction and just the amount of times we were looking at shots where characters who are so powerful were so small on the screen and you just saw the sky on fire. It was so horrifying to see what happened and to think that the only person who could truly stop it was Uncle Reaper. What a turn of events. And the fact that this man, as soon as he took off and just made a sword, was able to completely annihilate the beast that was destroying everyone, this character is insanely powerful. And then just the whole conclusion with Hajima Industries and how you think they're the most evil people and then to get the moments where we're building up to the whole like they know what's inside the plants but they're saying like 15 million people depend on this and we need more otherwise the whole world will collapse and they're not wrong they're definitely in it for the money but what they're doing isn't wrong it does sustain life in one life for 15 million the logic side says they are in the right even if they are in it for the profit and to see the whole idea that we're building up the Shinra almost becoming a catalyst for one of these machines once again and how the eighth was like absolutely not Vulcan coming in saying I will build a machine that doesn't require this pretty much gonna go into like solar hydro you know just like all the individual things that we have in our own world nuclear power and I'm sure he's going to succeed even though he had to sell off all rights so he's not gonna make a penny he's not the type of person who wants to make a penny he wants to make a better world and so characters like Shinra won't have to sweat and have to give up their life for something like that. I think this episode definitely showcased the Hydra Industries. They do care and would rather not have someone die in order to supply power to their city. But unfortunately, that's what has to happen. But they do want to turn a buck at the end of the day. And it's so interesting to see all those characters and those dilemmas because the show is just remarkable. This episode is one of the strongest out of both seasons. And you say that a lot with season two, don't get me wrong, but something about this episode in particular has me wanting to say it's my personal favorite Fire Force episode, but honestly, it just feels like you constantly say that because of how great the season has been. Let me know your thoughts and feelings though down below. What did you think of this very complex and emotionally draining episode, and how excited are you for next week? If you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a like to share your support and hit that subscribe button if you have to be new around here. So until next time, everyone, please take care and have a good one.